So I'm going to talk about DeFi meets real world assets, right? Which is the stellar outlook for 2023. So as everybody in this room knows, uh, blockchains for robustness need to replicate the ledger on a bunch of machines all around the world. And generally this means that you need a consensus protocol to make sure that all the copies agree on what the state of the, the blockchain, their ledger is. And the way most public blockchains do this is they use incentive-based consensus, right? So these are things like proof of work, proof of stake, where at a very high level, what we're doing is we're granting virtual currency, cryptocurrency to people as a reward for them doing things that make the consensus more secure. And this has a lot of advantages, right? It lets anybody participate anonymously in uh, administering the ledger. Um, and the open membership is really good because it, uh, it uh, helps censorship resistance, right? If like some miner won't include your transaction, well, maybe some other miner will, and so eventually you'll be able to publish your transaction. Um, and finally, incentives are an ideal mechanism for coin distribution. If you're creating a new cryptocurrency and you want to get the coins out there in a way that there's a limited supply, but people believe they have value, then mining uh, is great. But what I'm going to argue in this talk is that many tokens are actually better served by something that we call proof of agreement than either proof of work or proof of stake. And specifically, these incentive-based uh, consensus mechanisms are not ideal for issuer-backed tokens. So this is any token where the actual value of the token uh, comes from some promise that someone has made off-chain rather than something intrinsic to the blockchain. For example, uh, cash-backed uh, stable coins or tokenized securities, carbon credits, right? Uh, loyalty points, right? Anything where the blockchain, it's not the blockchain itself, but the fact that someone has promised to do something in the real world in exchange for those tokens. And the problem is that if your token transactions are too valuable, then the incentives uh, may be insufficient uh, for uh, security, right? Let's say that your miners are pulling in $20 million a day and now you're thinking of issuing like a trillion dollar CBDC or something on the blockchain, right? Those incentives aren't right. Like that's not good enough to, you know, protect uh, something of such high value. Whoops. Um, conversely, of course, if your, your uh, fees are too high, the incentives are too high, then you'll end up paying too much for your transactions. Another problem is that really you are kind of um, gratuitously extending the attack surface in a lot of cases, right? Think about it. Circle has sold over $40 billion worth of USDC, right? And uh, there's nothing in the blockchain that prevents them from just kind of walking away with that money and saying, you know, thank you very much, because the blockchain can't force them to wire money in exchange for redeemed USDC. Instead, what we have is we have courts, right? If they tried to steal the money, you could sue them. They might go to jail, right? And in general, as a society, we've kind of invested a lot in like, you know, protecting ownership rights and enforcing contracts and regulating our banks to keep them solvent. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's kind of, uh, we're depending on that stuff anyway to, to keep these tokens valuable. Um, so it's kind of unfortunate that we also need to depend on these incentives for the consensus mechanism. Conversely, from the issuer's point of view, they have to worry that if the people running the blockchain fork the blockchain, they might issue a bunch of, say, cashback stable coins and now face twice as many redemptions as they've issued coins. So what this means is that all blockchains on some level, regardless of the consensus protocol in the blockchain, actually require human agreement, right? People need to agree what consensus protocol is in use, what the parameters are, what transactions are valid, right? What the semantics are of transactions. And you see some examples of this. For example, with Ethereum in 2016, they introduced a change to the semantics. They had a weird one-time uh, state change in order to repair a theft uh, from a bug in the DAO contract, right? And you know, most people agree this is a good idea, not everyone. And so what we got is people who like the new rules continued to call the blockchain Ethereum. And then there was Ethereum Classic, uh, which kind of played by the original rules. And what's good about this is that at least we called them by different names. So there was, uh, you know, the, the, no, nobody got too confused. Last year, Ethereum switched from proof of work to proof of stake. But actually, there's a small contingent that prefer the proof of work. So they're called Ethereum POW now, or, or uh, ETHW, but what we mean by Ethereum is the new proof of stake protocol, right? So, uh, so this is all well and good, but what it means is that the underlying consensus of a blockchain is useless unless we also, on some level, have human agreement, right? Imagine that 
Coinbase and Binance did not agree on whether Ethereum had switched from proof of work to proof of stake last year, uh, this would have been catastrophic, right? Tokens sent from one exchange to the other exchange would have gotten lost and disappeared. Customers would have lost value. Everybody would have been angry. It would have cost the whole industry a huge amount of credibility and would have massively penalized both companies, right? So there's a huge amount of incentive for everybody to agree on what the rules are, right? But the thing is, usually this kind of human agreement is not actually formalized, right? To take another example, imagine you're forward looking and you put your uh, apartment lease on a blockchain, right? So you're renting an apartment, it's on the blockchain, you can show that on the blockchain you have a right to occupy this apartment, you come home and find a squatter, right? At some point you're gonna have to convince the police that you know, like this is the particular blockchain you're using and this contract is the one that governs your apartment and you know, for that, you will have to uh, possibly show like a paper contract that was like signed by your landlord. Okay, so uh, what we do in Stellar uh, is a little bit different. We do this thing called proof of agreement. And the basic idea here is to say, well, we kind of need human level agreement anyway so that any of these issuer back tokens uh, have value. So why not leverage that human level agreement, formalize it, and then leverage that for the consensus? Um, and the caveat here is that it doesn't work if you want to kind of distribute cryptocurrency the, the way you would mine Bitcoin, uh, but otherwise it works really well. And the way this works is that the validators are not anonymous machines out there. They are known entities with a reputation and each validator picks one or more sets of other validators that we call quorum slices that are basically the people that they definitely want to ag agree with, right? You have to agree with at least, you know, you're not gonna accept anything unless at least one of your quorum slices unanimously also agrees to that same thing. And then basically you only reach consensus when you're part of a set where every validator in that set has actually uh, been satisfied with a quorum slice. And the example that you have up here, um, we've got uh, three, four nodes, nodes V2, V3, V4, their quorum slice is all also v2, v3, v4. So that's a quorum, right? Everybody's happy if everybody in that set agrees. On the other hand, if you look at node v1, its quorum slice is v1, v2, v3. So that is a quorum slice, but it is not a quorum because v1 is saying, I'm only going to agree to something if v2 and v3 do. v2 and v3 are saying, we're only going to agree to stuff if v4 does as well. So the smallest quorum here that contains v1 is actually the set of all nodes, v1, v2, v3, v4. Right? So what's great about this is there's no proof of work needed, there's no staking uh, needed, so it means the, 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 the validators don't have to do a lot of work and the, and the consensus can be very fast, low latency. Um, and more importantly, token issuers can be protected, right? If you're issuing, say, a currency-backed stablecoin and you tell people, hey, I'll redeem this, this stablecoin for a dollar, right? You, you can say, and by the way, this is the particular validator that I'm gonna use to decide whether or not it's been redeemed. So if you care about my stablecoin, you might wanna put that validator in your quorum slice. And this now protects everyone from kind of disagreeing with the, the token issuer over who, who owns which tokens. All right, here's a little bit more pra uh, kind of uh, complex example of how quorum slices might work in practice, right? It could be that the world kind of organizes itself into a hierarchy of tiers, much the way the internet does, where you have tier one ISPs and then regional ISPs and, and, and so on, right? And um, there's a little problem here with the PDF, uh, not sure why, but, uh, but let's say for the sake of example that the top four um, uh, retail banks in the US become the uh, like kind of market forces decide that like this is going to be the top tier of validators. What's nice about this is just as you, nobody has to agree on what is and isn't a tier one ISP, it's just a thing that most people agree to and sometimes ISPs play chicken. Here we've got the same thing, right? Uh, so uh, V7 and V8 might say like, well, okay, we understand that we don't want to like have a divergent worldview from these large banks but we also don't trust them at all. We think they're gonna rip us off the first chance they get. Well, that's okay. With this proof of agreement, you can protect yourself. And what V7 and V8 can do is they can say, okay, you know what? We're gonna extend our quorum slices. So we're going to uh, require, that in order to believe that something happened, we're gonna require that two out of the four big banks agree to it. We're also going to require that one of these three nonprofits agrees to it uh, over on the right-hand side. We've got Stellar, EFF, and the ACLU. And maybe the, the nonprofits depend on three out of the four big banks, but also like two-thirds uh, of themselves, right? 
So now, just for the sake of argument, let's see why this protects V7 and V8 by seeing what would happen if, in fact, uh, these banks tried to misbehave. So suppose Citibank walks up to V7 and says, hey, V7, here's a billion dollars that I'm going to send you on the blockchain, and I would now like to leave with a billion dollars worth of goods from your store. I'd like to you know, fly away with you know, this fleet of airplanes that I bought from you. And so V7 is going to say, I'm only going to believe that I received a billion dollars if I'm part of a quorum that, uh, that actually where everybody uh, agrees that this transaction happened. V7 is going to say, I need two out of the four big banks. Okay, that checks out. I need one of the nonprofits. The nonprofit needs two out of the three nonprofits. This all checks out, right? If all the green check marks agree that this payment happened, V7 is happy and says, take your fleet of airplanes. Have a nice day. Thank you for the billion dollars. Now, Citibank colludes with a bunch of other big banks and tries to do a double spend attack. So they walk up to V8 and they say, hey, V8, uh, you know, here's a billion dollars. Please give us your fleet of airplanes, right? And now V8 is going to say, well, just a second. Uh, I want to make sure I'm part of a quorum that agrees I've really received the billion dollars. And I need one of these nonprofits. So Stellar and EFF are not going to agree to this. They know the billion dollars went to V7, but maybe the ACLU was straggling and like V8 got unlucky and talked to the ACLU. But the ACLU's quorum slice includes two thirds of the nonprofit. So ACLU is saying, well, I'm not going to believe this unless Stellar EFF does. They're not going to believe it. And therefore, uh, V8 is not going to fall victim to this double spend attack. OK. So that's the idea of proof of agreement. And Stellar has been uh, using proof of agreement with my SCP consensus protocol since 2015. Um, and a lot's happened since then. We've got a lot of relevant assets on the network today, including obviously USDC, but also more, more interesting recent assets like Franklin Templeton has an on blockchain government uh, treasuries uh, or, or bond uh, uh, mutual fund available. And what we have that's very gratifying is we've had now uh, a bunch of real world usage that's kind of beyond the blockchain community. So Vibrant, for example, is, is an app that lets people uh, save money in uh, US dollars. And this has been used by people in Argentina and other places with high inflation to be able to save money in a, in a stable currency. MoneyGram is uh, you know, a very large money transfer operator that even like, predates uh, blockchain. And they're using uh, uh, Stellar such that basically, if you have Stellar assets, you can uh, cash out in over 190 countries at their over 300,000 uh, uh, retail uh, locations. Right? And I think you can cash in in like a couple dozen countries now. And that's, that number is expanding. Uh, we recently released Stellar Aid Assist, which has been used, among others, by the UN High Commissioner on Refugees to send aid to uh, internally displaced people in Ukraine. So in general, Stellar has some of the least expensive and fastest transactions of any major blockchain. right? And the reason for that is that there's no need for mining. Running a Stellar validator is like running a full node in another blockchain. right? You don't need to be compensated to run a full node. You just do it because it's convenient to, to have a copy of the blockchain around. Um, the mo almost all operations cost less than one one hundredth of a penny to send, and so by configuration, the latency, like the ledger, closes every five seconds. Right? That's a configuration. We could reduce the number uh, if need be, but we don't want the ledger growing too fast right now, given the level of activity. Now, what's the bad news? The bad news is that today, Stellar lacks the extensibility of general purpose smart contracts. So if you want to issue assets or use our DEX or automated market making or hash time lock contracts or compliance features, we have all these features built into layer one, and you can use those exact versions. But if you want to implement your own arbitrary DeFi logic, you can't do it. And that is what is going to change in 2023. So 2023 is going to bring smart contracts to the Stellar mainnet using our new smart contract platform called Sorbon. And this means that you'll now be able to develop WebAssembly smart contracts uh, with the same inexpensive, low latency, issuer protecting proof of agreement consensus that we've been using for Stellar transactions all along. Uh, not only that, but these smart contracts will have full interoperability with Stellar's existing ecosystem, including all the existing assets, services, and on-off ramps that we have, like MoneyGram. So blocks basically now are going to contain two types of transactions. There will be classic transactions and smart transactions. And the classic transactions will have the same simplicity and low cost as today's network, that we're not changing that transaction format. The new smart transactions will invoke WebAssembly smart contracts. And what's cool is that these smart contracts will be able to access all the classic assets using the exact same interface as available for smart contract defined assets, right? So if you are 
if you want to issue an asset and you want people to use that asset in smart contracts, you might decide to issue it as a classic asset anyway, because then when people are just moving it around, they can use the classic transactions. Okay, so I think any kind of smart contract added to Stellar would be exciting, but there are a couple of things that are specific about Sorbon that we think are gonna make it very good for the blockchain. One is that we've designed it for parallel execution from the ground up. So transactions declare you know, what state they touch. It's very easy in advance to see which transactions will conflict and which can be executed concurrently. Um, Sorbon eliminates the need for most uh, serialization and deserialization, which is often uh, kind of an expensive part of using smart contracts. Uh, usually contracts can just manipulate uh, uh, handles for, uh, for more expressive types that are kind of in the, in the native runtime. There's a fine-grained calibrated gas model so that if your transaction, you know, if say com computation is a bottleneck, you won't have to like pay extra for storage with just, you know, the rate will go up for computation. And finally, there'll be state, uh, we're working on state archiving so as to ensure the long-term sustainability of the, block contract, of the blockchain, it won't, you know, the ledger state won't grow without bounds. Um, and, but also if like there's a particular ledger entry that's like your balance, uh, like a high balance in some token someone's issued and that accidentally gets archived because you didn't, forgot to pay your rent, you'll be able to recover that. It might be a little more than five seconds, but it will not be a catastrophe. So we also think Stellar is, uh, sorry, Sorbonne is gonna be good for developers because we've designed it uh, for general developers, whether or not they have Web3 experience. And in particular, we've used Rust, which is a general purpose, you know, widely supported programming language with obviously like a vibrant community and a lot of support. Uh, you know, if you don't like Rust, of course, you could use anything that compiles to WebAssembly. So that's, that's a lot of languages, but we're, we're building an, an SDK for Rust. Uh, we've also uh, pursued kind of a, a batteries included uh, approach where there's a lot of built-in contracts and host functions that make it simpler to uh, build a smart contract, but also make the resulting code smaller because you're just calling into the native, uh, native functions, and they also improve performance. Um, and finally, and I think probably most interesting to people who don't have a lot of uh, Web3 experience, is that we have a local sandbox that lets you compile all your smart contracts down to whatever you're running uh, on your local machine, like x86 or ARM uh, uh, native code. And this means that you can develop and test your smart contracts just as you would any other code, right? You know, you can have unit tests and whatever, and you can, and you can just run it all on the local machine. And you can even debug it using a deb uh, normal debugger like GDB. So if you're wondering why your smart contract's doing something while you're developing, you can just step through it uh, with the debugger and see everything that's happening. Of course, the real reason we're doing this um, is to improve financial access. So ultimately, we think Sorbonne is going to be really helpful for financial access. Already, Stellar reaches a lot of people who are underserved by existing financial products. Um, but unfortunately, I think the large organizations that we've been partnering with, you know, or who have been using it, things like the UN, um, you know, they tend to be relatively slow and cautious. And I think rightfully so, right? Like they, they shouldn't necessarily like, you know, embrace some new technology too quickly. Um, but that does mean it kind of limits the pace at which we, we can get this rolled out. Once we have Sorbon, it's gonna connect these underserved communities with really fast paced DeFi innovators, right? Who just work at like a much faster pace. And that's gonna open up the possibility of all kinds of new mechanisms for things like liquidity, lending, borrowing, and so on. But of course, ultimately, the real value of smart contracts isn't the applications that you anticipate, it's the ones you don't anticipate, right? Because if you anticipate the application, you could always just kind of like hard code it in the layer one. So we're really most excited to see what it is that people are gonna come up with and how that can help the communities who are already served by Stellar. So thank you, and if you uh, want uh, more information, you can go to sorabon.stellar.org. Uh,